I think a materialist approach to things is very, very consistent with uh, my experience in Christian social justice. I feel like the, more, the deeper I get into anarchist practice, the deeper my faith is getting at the same time. I would hope that you know, securing means of life for all would be something all people of faith would say, oh yes, that's at the basis of what we can believe. And those who are most marginalized know the most about the truth, Thank good you. and the beautiful. To me, it's less that I think building class solidarity is a bad thing, as much as it seems like if you don't attend to things like anti-black racism, um, that's always going to get in the way of building class solidarity, actually. And when you go back, you find that a lot of uh, revolutionary grassroots participatory movements, the, the precursors to what you could call um, the barrio assemblies and these like, you know, grassroots neighborhood organizations, a lot of these were sponsored by the church. What does it mean to say that the Christian tradition is internally contradictory and there are antagonisms there? Um, you're always uh, being faithful to some aspects and betraying other aspects. Welcome to The Magnificast, the podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. I'm Dean Detloff, and I am your Marxist moral ethicist for today. <laughs> and I'm Matt Bernico, the co-host of this podcast, and I'm the, the bad boy of moral philosophy. <laughs> Me? Morals? No, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't the have Bart any. Simpson of Christian podcasts over here. Eat my eat my shorts are my morals. <laughs> um, yep, this week, if you haven't guessed already, and how could you not have, we are talking with Taylor Genovese about morality, about a really fantastic uh, essay that he wrote called The Necessity of Morality at Peace Land Bread, a, uh, a theoretical journal for revolutionary practice. Um, you can learn more about what that means <laughs> by going to peacelandbread.com. Um, the article will be linked in our show notes, but it's a really lovely, fantastic essay trying to sort through um, not only the ambiguities of morality in the Marxist tradition, as you'll hear in the next hour, but also uh, making a, a strong appeal for morality. Um, I think we had a lot of fun talking with Richard Gilman Opalski recently about uh, communism and love. So I guess we're just on that train trying to figure out uh, what other um, Christian adjacent terms <laughs> appear in communist literature. Yeah, totally. There's a lot of very similar themes and vibes to Richard's book. So it's really cool. Um, I like it a lot. I, I think um, not only is it just like helpful, um, a helpful reading of Marx and Lenin and kind of getting into a topic, but it's also kind of an instructive thing. And I really like that. So read it and learn how to be a moral person. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess. I don't know. Um, that's between you and this essay. <laughs> Um, but before we go to the interview, let me let me give you a little pitch here. Usually at the very end of every episode, we say, um, if you like what you heard, you can support us on Patreon. But now we're going to do it at the very beginning of the episode right now. Um, if you do like the Magnificast, if you feel led by the spirit of Jesus, of communism, whichever one, maybe you might want to contribute a little bit of money to our show to help us do what we do. Um, you can find us at patreon.com slash the Magnificast. Uh, when you sign up at, at the level of $2 or more, you get cool things like an early episode when we, when we have them, <laughs> which isn't all the time. Um, we're this one's going to be folks. late, ironically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> um, but you do get other things too. If you subscribe at higher levels, you can get a cool sticker, uh, a Patreon only sticker. That's great. Um, the other thing is uh, we have a uh, a Patreon only Discord channel. So if you want to get in there, you can meet some of your fellow Magnificast fans. You can talk to us. You can hear us. Well, you don't hear us. You can read the things that we say in there. It's actually been really fun. Mm -hmm. um, we've been doing it, I guess, for about two weeks now, and it's been really rad having to you know people to talk to. Um, not about the Magnificast specifically, but just about other adjacent topics. So if you want to get in on this good stuff, uh, give us $2 and you can come on in. Um, the doors are open, I guess, for $2. <laughs> That's right. That's the, the entrance fee. That's true. The tithe that you all have to pay in order to uh, to keep the lights on in this, this big uh, youth group building that we do rent out from uh, the owner of the local shopping mall. Um, <laughs> with all that said, what a great segue to hear uh, Taylor tell us how to be moral people. Let's turn it over to Taylor.
Today on the Magnificast, we're joined by Taylor Genovese. Uh, Taylor, thanks for coming on the show. But before we uh, dive into talking about your very cool essay on communism and morality, would you mind just introducing yourself and telling us who you are and what you're all about? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, I'm an anthropologist and I'm a PhD candidate at Arizona State University. Uh, I'm in an interdisciplinary program that's called the Human and Social Dimensions of Science and Technology, which is a big mouthful. Um, but I'm also affiliated with the Center for the Study of Religion and Conflict. Uh, and I, I study the intersections of religion and politics, um, science and technology across a couple of projects. So my main dissertation project looks at the continuities and disjunctions in how this Russian theology called cosmism, um, which advocates for the right of human immortality and resurrection of one's ancestors, uh, interacts with both the Soviet space program and kind of has this like twisted connection to uh, Silicon Valley technologists today. Uh, and then I also look at various political and act affective forms of the current U.S.-Mexico border wall. That's my latest um, project. Um, I'm also adjunct faculty uh, in the Department of Anthropology at Chandler Gilbert Community College. And I've had the good fortune and honor of having you both guest lecture for my students. So now it's all coming full circle and I get the greatest honor of all by appearing on the Magnificast. So thank you both for having me. <laughs> well, thank you for having us respectively. That's great. We've all been on each other's platforms <laughs> yeah right perfect reciprocity <laughs> yeah that's right that's what solidarity really means that's right yeah the gift economy is here man i'm so jealous uh of your research projects talking about cosmism and communism is the coolest thing in the world we'll have to have you back on the show to talk about that later uh because that is very fun and extremely yeah. relevant to both matt and i's interests um, yeah that would be but, awesome yeah we will make it happen um, this time around, though, we're really excited to talk about your your short essay, The Necessity of Communist Morality, in the uh, neat little magazine called Peace, Land, and Bread. Uh, if people haven't seen it, you should. Um, and the PDF is really nice to look at as well, which helps uh, when you're reading. Um, we usually start off conversations about essays and articles by asking the author to give a, a little elevator pitch for what their piece is all about. Could you do that for this essay? What's it about? Uh, what were you trying to do with it? Um, what do you hope people get out of it? Sure, yeah. Um, communist morality is, you know, like totally necessary. No, that's not. That's not. That's a short saying. elevator ride. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, in all seriousness, uh, uh, what I'm really trying to explore in this article um, is this aversion or even this kind of like disavowal. Uh, for most folks in the Marxist tradition towards morals or morality. Uh, and instead, I'm really trying to make the argument that communists are foremost moral actors and that we draw from this explicit, but at least outside of the revolutionary um, or the religious left, um, is usually nebulously defined uh, as this communist morality. Um, so I argue these points primarily through texts by Lenin uh, and mostly through state and revolution. Uh, and one could even probably make the argument that I'm playing with the text a little bit by replacing the state with morality in his arguments. Um, so following Lenin, I'm, I'm arguing that there is and there really needs to be a moral struggle that's waged in a similar manner uh, and upon the same historical stage as class struggle is. Uh, and ultimately, I make the argument um, that morality needs to be confronted uh, it needs to be utilized by contemporary communists um, by contending with four dialectical pairs. Um, so the the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, pretty easy one to uh, <laughs> that it's going to appear in like all communist philosophy, right? Um, the individual and society, which I I peg as really being the most important one when it comes to morals. The semiotic or like meaning making practices and nature, and then as this kind of like specter that haunts all three. Uh, is oppression and subordination. Um, and that's a, that's kind of the main thrust. And I'm sure we'll get into the conclusions and the meat of the argument uh, a little later. Yeah, I think that's great. Uh, a great overview of what this is all about. Your essay starts off with uh, Marx rather than Lenin, uh, noting some of the tensions between Marx's analysis and also his disdain for morality, which is, I think, pretty interesting. Something that I know I've read but never really gave a whole lot of thought to. So... Um, as your article makes the case, though, there's a it's a bit more complicated than just like Marx doesn't like morals or something. So to get us started and thinking through this, could you just give us like a scoop on Marx and morality? Like, what's his big problem? Yeah, Papa Caro, why are you so down on morals? <laughs> um, yeah, yes. 
I found it really interesting, actually. So as I, I re-dug in the Capitol and I started reading, uh, rereading his political writings uh, while researching this article, um, his he had these really complex feelings on morality. And that really surprised me because in general, Marx tends to equate morals and morality with ideology, right? Um, moral concepts like justice or good or evil and and these institutions like religion or philosophy or law, they're usually analyzed as concepts that emerge out of the material relations of humanity and, and, and their means of production. But, um, and if, if one takes that system of logic seriously, as Marx does on one hand, uh, it totally makes sense why he writes that the capitalists exploiting the workers is not just uh, an unjust system. Uh, you know, he, at one point in capital, even he says like, all it is is just a good piece you know, good piece of luck for the buyer or something like that. Like it's a totally flippant uh, uh, disregard for like the workers in a way. Um, but then at the same time, there's these passages later in Capital One in which his like positivist mask starts to come off and he just like passionately rails against the capitalist and capitalism. And he uses these really morally charged words and phrases like stolen and in exploited and embezzled, etc., um, and so there's this complexity there with Marx's thoughts. Um, and Engels too, he, he has these, Engels writes about morals as well. And he has these really interesting passage actually, in which he refers to a time in which morality will stand above class antagonisms. Now that sounds like completely different and even possibly antagonistic to most mainstream Marxist historical materialist views of morality. Um, so both Marx and Engels, they have this very complicated relationship with with morality, I think, um, where at once they see it as as this creation of humanity, and therefore it's somewhat value neutral because it depends entirely on material, material relations, um, but also that it's this very important and visceral force that motivates and rallies and even at times acts as a better method of explaining the evil and injustices that are inherent within capitalism. Yeah, I think that's what's so fascinating about how you draw this out in your article, because, you know, on the one hand, like, it almost feels a bit strange to say that Marx is averse to morals, because I think most people, at least in my own experience, uh, come to Marx, not because they, you know, they were like bowled over by the scientific accuracy of capital or something, but because, you know, they have some kind of moral commitment and Marx actually helps you to articulate uh, why your morals are um, bumping up against something happening in capitalism. Um, when you said that thing about Engels, too, it sort of gets me thinking about religion, which is a, a subtext in your article that we can maybe make a little more prominent in our conversation. You know, so you say Engels has this sort of picture of one day perhaps morals will stand above class antagonisms. Um, I think a lot of Christians would uh, resonate with such a future, right? This kind of eschatological vision. Um, since we talk on this podcast about Christianity and the, the left, we have to ask you about religion as well. So maybe that's like a good segue. Um, in the essay, you explain a, a model of morality that's situated between dialectics. Um, so classes or individuals in society or humans in nature and so on. Um, what do you think about the ways that maybe religious leftists have engaged uh, morals or moral language or the moral question? You know, re religion is, for better or worse, often a, a vehicle for morality. Um, do you think something like liberation theology or similar sorts of movements might be in line with the the moral direction that you're kind of uh, following in Marxism? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, as someone who's a novice, but I'm an eager student of liberation theology, I felt like I was kind of in a way backdooring liberation theology in this article uh, without being explicit or dogmatic about it. Um, but actually, if it's okay with you two, I want to save the discussion for liberation theology specifically uh, for a bit later. Uh, and instead, I want to talk about a few figu figures on the religious left canon that I think really exemplify this kind of communist morality, uh, despite the fact that they may not have explicitly called it that. Um, mm -hmm. the, the first is our Magnificast main man, Father Thomas Haggerty, who I think you all actually have a, an episode devoted to him, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. So folks, if you uh, should check that out, if they haven't uh, heard that one, so Haggerty, of course, is probably most well known outside of the religious left as one of the founders of the IWW, um, the Industrial Workers of the World, this project that continues to this day, uh, attempting to create one big union for all workers across all trades and professions. But um, Haggerty and many on the religious left um, seem capable um, through their specific radical theologies 
um, to express such intense revolutionary moral discipline. Um, and I think Dean, I think you actually wrote an article about Haggerty in which you recount, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong on, on the details, uh, you recount the story about, um, a socialist party meeting, uh, in which Haggerty like finally becomes fed up with the reformism of the party. And he like railed against them so loudly and intensely and passionately at the meeting that the chairperson like actually broke their gavel trying to stop mm-hmm. Haggerty from, <laughs> from, uh, speaking. Um, and so there's, there's this, this kind of this passionate, uh, disciplined, uh, morality in, in folks like him. Um, the other person that's gotten this uptick in interest lately, um, especially since the late, latest Showtime series is John Brown. Um, and, and Brown drew almost all of his moral convictions from scripture. Um, but he's a bit cheeky with it too. Um, in what I would argue would be a dialogue, uh, like a dialectical reconfiguration, although he certainly wouldn't have used that terminology. Um, but he would forge these various alliances and work with a variety of folks who, as long as they were abolitionists, were welcome to fight alongside him. You know, uh, Brown stole almost all of his food, all of his weaponry, all of his belongings um, while fighting during the bloody Kansas campaigns. And um, he, he was solidly justifying these supposed bourgeois moral wrongs through this proletarian Christian moralism um, that understood that the property of slave owners uh, and slaveholders was a moral contradiction and an abomination since those same slaveholders believed in the ownership of human beings. So therefore stealing their wagons, stealing their horses, stealing their food, etc., was morally right. It was morally just. Uh, and he justified all this through the Bible, through the words and actions of Jesus Christ. So um, I think this kind of discipline, this uh, zealotry, this, this dialectical reasoning that dovetails into a refusal to bend one's revolutionary principles is definitely drawn from a moral framework. Um, from the religious left that more communists need to engage in. Hard to argue with you there. I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those are great examples. Um, man, uh, John, the, the John Brown show on Showtime, the good Lord bird um, really reignited. I think an interest I did not know I had so deeply about John Brown. I mean, I've always kind of known, mm-hmm. known his story a little bit, but uh, that show really sparked something in me. I um, went and read W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, uh, biography of him and uh i think yeah I, I mean calling his life like something that's like a, a principled moralism based on christianity is like <laughs> i mean kind of underselling it <laughs> he's such a zealot oh yeah right, such a right. zealot but but moved to like really do something about it i mean i think that's the thing about some people that hold religious values and like very strong moral values is that you know They'll express them in some ways, like, you know, you go to a protest or whatever, you go on strike or you speak out against something and that's great. But John Brown was like a, a deeply, a deeply convicted person when it came to these things, so much so that like, I don't know, he killed people in extremely brutal ways <laughs> just to like, you know, mm-hmm. because you believe so, so, um, so deeply in it, so deeply in it. Um, in, in the show, the good Lord bird, this is not a spoiler alert for sure. People, if you know anything about John Brown, this is not surprising to you, (laughs) but there is a moment, um, where, uh, he's about to like behead somebody who like, um, he thinks like owns slaves and, um, everyone that's with him, like his sons and his like sort of crew is like a little bit like, I don't know, maybe you shouldn't behead this guy. And John, I'm not making him out to be a very uh, relatable character right now, but anyways, <laughs> no, it's, but this is kind of like the darkest moment. Yeah, it is completely the <laughs> darkest moment in the entire show. But uh, John Brown's like, we well, you know, like, um, like, what would you do? Like if, if it was your sister that he had owned or something and like, and everyone was like, yeah, I guess chop his head off. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and I mean, I know that is the darkest point in the entire show. I guess all of that to say, though, that uh, that those religious beliefs, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse, maybe in this case, um, you know, somebody like John Brown is a great exemplar of because like they really believe them in this in this way, I think in in this deep way that I think a lot of other people don't. And, uh, you know, it has its problems and its pathologies for sure. But it's a uh, it's an interesting mm-hmm. thing to think through. That's to say the least. OK, sorry, uh, John Brown. That's <laughs> like the show a lot. That's all I'm trying to say. Hey, he's a he's an excellent tangential uh, character for sure. Absolutely. Um, okay, well, you you wanted to push off the conversation about liberation theology a little bit here, and um, we let it slide, but we're not going to let it slide anymore. Now you have to talk about liberation theology. Um, in, <laughs> okay. in the first note of your in the first footnote of your essay, you said that one of the deficits of your argument is that you don't engage with liberation theology in particular. 
and that's fine. Um, you know, your one essay can't cover every single thing that exists. So no, no fault there. But um, I don't know. Do you have any hunches about liberation theology specifically? Um, you know, like what what about it might suggest uh, that it's an important next step in the thought process of morals and communism? Well, the first is is pretty obvious, um, right? I'm I'm talking about morality that's grounded in communist philosophy, particularly Marxism, and a project that continues on those grounds without engaging in in the longstanding, rich and continued tradition of liberation theology is it's just missing an enormous piece of the picture, right? Um, but on a more political, pragmatic level, um, I think that engaging liberation theology specifically becomes very important in order to break the North Atlantic or, or Euro-American centering of radical political theory. So liberation theology as this kind of grassroots movement in the global South, particularly in Latin America, um, is an important intellectual, theological, and political tradition in order to decolonize the way we live our lives or the way we conduct our scholarship, um, the way we perceive our research, uh, and the ways we engage with our morality. Um, so I'm particularly drawn to this Mexican liberation theologian Enrique Duso, uh, introduced to me um, by my comrade George Chicarillo Omar, um, also my comrade and colleague at ASU, Mario Rospe Hernandez, who was actually a student of Dussel's. Um, but Dussel discusses this um, this way that liberation theology has the power to create an epistemic rupture um, that not only both critiques and challenges these assumptions of Euro-American philosophy, um, but it also commits to what he calls a South-South dialogue, um, which are like these attempts to bypass the authority of the dominant North Atlantic kind of philosophical trends in a kind of um, political moral project that makes Europe and the U.S. answer to Latin American philosophy instead of the usual academic hegemony of it being the other way around. So I think um, this intellectual and theological inversion uh, is incredibly important for a project centered on communist morality. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and uh, bringing up Dussel is always welcome on the podcast for sure. Uh, big fans of Dussel, uh, who who seems to really get what you're talking about in a big way, right? That there is something, uh, some important role for morals to play, even if it has to be sorted out on the left. Um, you know, we've talked on the show before about how one of our favorite liberation theologians, um, a Brazilian priest named Fray Beto, has mm. said that Cuba shows that uh, communism takes a lot of spiritual discipline, trying to maybe bring together that that moral language and that theological language. Um, so he says, you know, you have to become the kind of person who puts social needs above individual wants, which is a really hard thing to do if you've been a, in a capitalist society for a long time. Um, is there something like that with morality, too? You know, you, you try to argue for a communist morality. Um, how can we think about how communism also fosters a certain moral orientation in the world or makes it possible to be a, a, a sort of moral actor as Fry Beto is, is trying to help us see? Yes. Yeah, I, this is great. I. I really like this question. Uh, you know, like a, a big part of my research actually is is negotiating how to perform work on myself in certain ways that'll open up critical apparatuses for studying like the more than human or the supernatural um, through the categories of my research participants because I grew up in a in a non religious household. Um, it wasn't hostile to religion, but I, we just didn't really have, I didn't have a religious upbringing. So one of the experiments I'm conducting is on myself. Um, so recognizing that I'm, I'm disciplined in these particular secular Western ways of knowing and experiencing and thinking about the world uh, and how I might in a similar way as learning to become a person who puts the needs of the community above oneself, um, that I have the ability to recognize or should uh, learn to have the ability to recognize certain uh, ontological or moral realities of my research participants. So realities such as good and evil, spirits and ghosts, you know, possessions and the demonic, agentive cosmic energy, you know, uh, things like this. Um, but to come back to the the question, the 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 moral question in communism is not one way, right? Um, and I argue this in my piece as well. Communism as a moral philosophy. Uh, transforms the way that we as communists see and interact with the world. Um, we may practice certain communistic practices or analyze social relations through a communist lens, um, but 
we rarely become aware of the fact that communism is also practicing and analyzing us. So th this is this is kind of like a, the moral dialectic. Um, so this is what I mean when I say at the beginning of my essay that a communist is foremost a moral actor. Um, it's because communism explicitly fosters a particular proletarian morality in us. Um, we make our decisions in our everyday lives through this communist morality. Um, but I also believe that it takes work. Uh, it takes labor on oneself, particularly those of us in the global north, uh, in order to have communism transform our morality. And I think that's the kind of um, spiritual discipline that Fray Beto um, refers to within our context or my context of this article. Uh, and I think that's very important to pay attention to. That's such a cool way of putting it. I really like that. Um, this kind of turns the conversation away from the religious aspect of it all, but I think uh, sticks with a lot of the big themes still. So uh, after we read your article, there's this um, this this like pretty famous clip of Fidel Castro that Dean and I both talked about. <laughs> we, we identified that this is like what stuck out to us, I guess, or what what, what your article made us think about. Um, so there's like this famous clip of Fidel Castro. I'm not exactly sure where the clip comes from. I think I remember seeing it in a documentary called uh, Cuba and the Cameraman, but I it could come from somewhere else. I'm not exactly sure. But it's a it's a clip of Fidel Castro. He's on a plane to, uh, going to New York City. And um, he's asked by a reporter if he's wearing like a bulletproof vest. And Fidel thinks <laughs> this is very funny. And he's very amused. And he like unbuttons his shirt and he's like all like hairy and like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know why I include that part, but it seems important. <laughs> <laughs> but he unbuttons his shirt and he shows that he's like he's he's not wearing a bulletproof vest. Uh, and he tells the reporter that instead he's wearing a moral vest. Um, and I think mm -hmm. there's something kind of uh, there's something interesting about that. Um, so is mm -hmm. is there a way that communist morality might also help to defend communism? I mean, that's kind of what Fidel means by it, right? That he doesn't wear a bulletproof vest because, you know, he's loved by the people. He doesn't think that he needs to, right? He, there's no, uh, he's not afraid of somebody coming up to shoot him because he has that sort of like that moral, um, I don't know, that moral air about him that he's doing the right thing. So no one wants to assassinate him, even though some people do want to assassinate him. So I don't know <laughs> when Fidel says something like that uh, about the moral vest uh, in defense of communism. Uh, I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I, I love that interview so much. It's it's like such a purely Fidel moment too, um, <laughs> <laughs> like the way that he acts and talks in that that interview. Um, yeah, yes. Uh, so I'll start with the first part of that question on whether um, a communist morality might help defend communism. Uh, and then I'll return to Fidel's wonderful antics uh, in that interview. Um, I'll turn to, so I'm in agreement with Lenin here that that a communist morality resoundingly does defend communism. Um, I argue in my piece that Lenin's moral turn, if you want to call it that, I don't know if anyone does, but I'll throw it out there. Why not? Um, it kind of starts when he drafts his April theses um, on the eve of the July days and the October Revolution uh, in 1917. And um, I mention this because it absolutely shocked his Bolshevik base when he published these things because they seemed like this ultra left manifesto. You know, he like demanded that World War One be transformed into this world revolutionary war against the bourgeoisie. Uh, he said there should be this rigid refusal to work with the Russian provisional government. Um, he wanted the immediate transference of the entirety of state power to the Soviets. Uh, he wanted the complete abolition of the police, the army, and the bureaucracy. Uh, he wanted all incomes to be equitably equitably leveled. Uh, nationalization of all lands include banks. I mean, even anarchist affinity groups like align themselves with the Bolsheviks after these were published because they were so far left. And um, actually, during the Russian Civil War, these these anarchists would become to be called the seemingly oxymoronic term now of the Soviet anarchists. But anyway, while, while Lenin's demands were political in this sense, they were really formed on this deep sense of moral justice, this kind of reckoning uh, with what would be best for both the individual and the socialist society he demanded to be created. Um, and in the article, I think I argue that the April theses laid the possibilities for what I call an actually existing communist morality, um, a little bit tongue in cheek, but um after the revolution, Lenin also singled out this movement called the Subotniks that I want to talk about real, uh, just briefly, um, which I think is a really interesting example of a grassroots movement of workers who attempted to reconfigure their relationship with the labor through communist morals in order to defend communism. Um, 
So Subotnik like literally means uh, Sab- Sabbathian or, or Saturdayian in Russian. Um, but it was this movement of workers who would go out on Saturdays and they'd voluntarily work without pay on these public works projects in cities throughout the Soviet Union, you know, quite literally building socialism. Um, and Lenin said that the Subotnik movement was more difficult, more tangible, more radical, more decisive than even the overthrow of the bourgeoisie. And he was so inspired that he actually became a Subotnik himself for a brief period of time prior to his health problems. So I think the... Uh, these kinds of examples are really interesting when looking at how um, how morality uh, itself can be a defense for communism. Um, okay, so now I, I want to pivot back to Fidel's evocative moral vest statement because I think it's great, um, and I think it's important. Actually, I don't think I don't think uh, him saying that was flippant. Um, I think he meant a couple of things. Um, the first, I think, relates back. Um, to what you said about communism itself kind of fostering this moral uh, orientation in the world. Um, so Fidel knew that the people weren't hostile to him, the the people that were there, you know, hell, there were like rallies in Harlem, like welcoming him and like uh, uh, signs saying like Fidel is always welcome or whatever. Um, so he was confident in the moral orientation of the American proletariat, particularly people of color. Uh, in a way, the, the people, uh, there were a vest, um, you know, for him. Uh, now the second relates back to, uh, the rev the revolutionary moral discipline, um, that fosters such resiliency, uh, in this kind of, um, bitter hostility, especially in Fidel's case. Um, and I hope you'll forgive me again, but as an anthropologist, we love telling stories. So, um, <laughs> I was, I was, when I was thinking about this story of the moral vest, um, it kept reminding me of this man named Stephen Simmons Foster. Do either of you know who he was? Mm, no, no. Um, he was a follower of William Lloyd Garrison. So the famous abolitionist in the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And Foster, like John Brown, was this Christian zealot for abolition. And there's this story about him in the sum- uh, in one summer evening in 1842. Um, Foster goes into this congressional meeting house in Lynn, Massachusetts. And he just starts like railing against the evils of slavery and how everyone there is complicit, even though they're in the North because they're not doing enough. And uh, much like Haggerty, he refuses the quiet, quiet down. The like reverend is reprimanding him and everybody's booing him. Uh, eventually three men of the congregation surround him. They lift him up over their heads and they just like violently throw him out of the church doors on onto the ground. And Foster, he picks himself up. He just dusts himself off. He walks across the, st- uh, across the street to the Baptist congregation and he goes inside and he starts the same thing, just like railing about the evils of slavery, how they're all complicit. Uh, again, folks surround him. They tear his clothes. They throw him out. Um, so then Foster goes to the Quaker meeting. <laughs> that's like a couple doors down. Um, and the Quakers of all people uh, also tear his clothing and they like throw him out of the Quaker house. Um, but what's interesting, I think, about him is that by the end of 1842, Foster had been violently thrown out of 24 churches twice from the second story. Um, He was arrested and jailed four times. He was nearly lynched once. So I tell this story because I I think it's similar to this moral conviction that I'm arguing for Um, this refusal to yield because you're confident in communism's moral justice. And likewise, uh, communism uh, transmutes your morality to illumine humanity's goodness within you. Um, and this is the moral vest that I think Fidel is referring to. You know, the U.S. like tried to assassinate him like 600 times or something. Um, and it, so I don't think he was being cocky or reckless or anything when he said he didn't wear a bulletproof vest. But instead, similar to the abolitionist Foster, he was confident in the efficacy of that moral vest instead. Yeah, I love that. Um, that seems like such a good way of understanding Fidel's um, definitely more cocky, cockier moments as well. Right. That uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. he he is that way because he has this sort of um, kind of irrational but inspiring uh, faith in in what's going on, you know, in building a, a different society in Cuba. That's great. I'm going to be thinking about that for a while. Um so I think this is a good time to pivot to the maybe the dark side of morality and work here. We can work out some of the complications. I mean, you've given us a good 
uh, a good height. So now we can check out the other side. Um, you know, morals are always a really tough conversation, both for theological and political communities. Um, on the one hand, there there is this kind of dogmatic moral commitment that that you're talking about that allows for really courageous actions and stances. Um, on the other hand, though, that same kind of dogmatic commitment can lead uh, progressive movements even to baptize really reactionary ideas. Um, mm-hmm. And just because we're talking about Fidel, um, you know, the Cuban Revolution is a great example because uh, it, it's a strong moral revolution, but for that same reason. Uh, you know, sex workers and LGBT people suffered as the revolutionary society tried to find its feet. And, you know, they famously thought that uh, homosexuality was a sort of capitalist, um, you know, degeneration or, or whatever. So, um, right. and, and, you know, it's important to re- for listeners to know that Cuba doesn't think that anymore. <laughs> but it's important to recognize that it, it, it matters when we talk about communist morality. So how can communist morality negotiate these kinds of, of challenges? Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, so this is the great danger in all morality, right? And, and this includes the communist morality. Uh, the Cuban example is a really good one. Um, I also give the example of the moral code of the building of communism uh, in the Soviet Union, which uh, codified the terms of a person's relationship to Soviet society as also being kind of a, a, a negative or going too far in the opposite direction. Um, so in my piece, I argue that the Soviet moral code and the Cuban revolution's initial violent repression of sex workers and LGBTQI folks, um, which, as you said, Dean, the the revolutionary government has since started to take, I think, really good steps towards restorative justice in that regard. Um, They they failed because these moral projects were neither dialectical nor materialist. I think they lost their their way in 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 that regard. Um, So instead, uh, they would be what moral philosophers call deontological methods or they rest within these decrees of virtue, um, uh, much like many reactionary moral philosophies, actually. So think here of the Nazi program called um, the the Nine Commandments or something, Nine Commandments of Moral, of Worker Struggle, I think. Nine Commandments of Worker Struggle. Uh, Goring came up with it, of course. Uh, he said something like, women needed to take a pot, a dustpan, a broom, and then marry a man. Um, like that was the, the like moral uh, uh, direction of of women in Nazi society, right? So when these morals become inscribed and codified as commandments um, within a society, I think they start to lose their potential to shift dialogically uh, within a society's material conditions. And so without without this fluidity, uh, the risk of the individual being dominated and coerced um, by values of the ruling class or even just kind of like a dormant or values from the past um, that starts to increase. And that's when I think the project of morality becomes unmoored from the communist struggle. It's a great, uh, a great way to think through that kind of carefully. I appreciate that attention to the, to the details there. Your entire article, I think, is very playful in a very kind of fun way. Um, you're always sort of riffing on a lot of uh, phrases and themes within uh, socialist literature and communist literature. And the end of the mm-hmm. article is definitely no, uh, uh, no exception. <laughs> so towards the yeah. end, uh, you you make this kind of like fun play on um, uh, on Lenin's withering of the state. Um, but instead of the withering of the state, you talk about um, the withering away of morality. And I think that's a, a really challenging way to put it, I think. Um, but uh, but it's really interesting when you kind of get to the point. So uh, you write in your essay, money can no longer exist when there's only communal abundance. Rights can no longer exist when there's only justice. Morality can no longer exist when there's only collective love and solidarity. So uh, when you're talking about the withering away of morality, you know, you're talking about the, I mean, I guess the... Um, the completion of a communist project, or maybe not the completion, but, uh, you know, the, the coming to fruition of a, a particular type of project. Um, mm-hmm. The the withering away of morality might be a hard sell for some people just because it sounds bad, but it's not exactly the way that you mean it. But anyways, can you can you explain like, uh, you know, what that all means and how you how you get there in your essay? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that's uh, I think it's a pretty hard sell for anyone, honestly, hearing uh, just that. But um yeah, what, so I wrote this because one of the things that I really find lacking in Marxist scholarship is this willingness to speculate and to play. Um, 
And so what I really wanted to do in that last section of my article was to just play a little bit. Um, I wanted to uh, forge a reconstitution within kind of our collective dreamscape um, in regards to the way that we think about morals or the way that we think about a state or even the way we think about Lenin's famous and really evocative idea of withering, I think, is a, is a um, just a word that's really great to latch on to. Um, and I did it in a bit of a roundabout way. Um, I decided to do a little bit of imagining. And so I thought, what would happen if we were actually able to smash the state? Um, now, that might drive up the hackles on a lot of Marxists, uh, but but it really shouldn't actually, because... Uh, Marx and Engels and Lenin and and many other Marxist thinkers all basically agreed that the bourgeois state needed to be smashed, um, particularly after seeing the tragic fate of the Paris Commune. Um, uh, it's only after we smash this bourgeois state that a lot of the anarchists and Marxists start to get prickly with each other. Um, so I wanted to see if I could attempt to resolve possibly naively some of this tension um, through a playful conceptual reconstitution. So I initially asked the question following uh, Lenin and state and revolution, um, should we call a worker state, um, which is tasked with the oppression of the bourgeoisie, a, a state at all? Um, so if we have this socioeconomic political thing uh, that's controlled by workers and acts in their interests, uh, and therefore, it doesn't act like any state that's ever existed in the history of humanity. Then should we even really call it a state? Um, of course, this kind of ambiguity is also what Lenin is referring to when he's describing the withering away of the state. Um, but I then also try and reconceptualize and play with this idea of withering as well. Because um, I don't think of withering in this instance as fading away, um, but rather as something that something that makes your eyes cross and blurs your vision. It's, it's, uh, it's something that's hard to concentrate on because it becomes so dissimilar and unrecognizable to anything anyone has ever experienced before. Uh, and so I take that same framework and turn my imagination towards morals. Uh, and I especially uh, think back to that Engels quote about morality existing above class antagonisms. Well, what would exactly happen to our communist morals if they were no longer in a dialectic with bourgeois morals? Well, suddenly we have this really vague morality that's not acting like any morality that's ever existed in the history of humanity. So should we still name them morals at this point then, right? So so this withering of morals isn't, I don't, I don't think is a, a gentle vanishing, but is instead uh, this active creative forging of conceptual uh, reconstitution um, so, so that they become something so strange and so new and beautiful. And, um, uh, only then do the oppressive kind of bourgeois morals begin to slowly fade from our memory. And then, and then maybe then, um, at that point, then we're left with those rather flowery last lines I wrote in the piece. Well, uh, they're, they're nice flowers. They smell great. Love to look at them. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think you're right, though, that Marxists have a hard time being playful uh, for a number of reasons. I mean, Christians do, too, right? It's a, I don't know, mm. something about having like a, a stuffy notion of orthodoxy, uh, whether mm -hmm. you're going to church or going to the party meeting, I think uh, can inculcate some of that. Right. Um but yeah, it's good to uh, to kind of keep things loose and, and plastic and, and mess around with them a bit. Um, so I guess I'm going to do that. I'm going to force you to do that <laughs> toward the end of this conversation. Um, <laughs> so playful. You know, so toward... playful of you. I'm ready. Yeah, yeah exactly. Play. If we're all loosened up now, um, toward the end of your, your essay, you ask this big Leninist question, you know, what is to be done? What should be done? Um, so I guess I'm asking you uh, to let us know what should be done with communist morals, um, even while we're stuck under the bourgeois state for now. <laughs> oh, good. Finally, a softball question. An easy one. <laughs> what should be done? Shall we go? Yeah, great. <laughs> no, but really. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I think imagination and dreaming is good. Um, but we also need to worry about the actual praxis, right? Or, or this is what I call in the article, a counter hegemonic project of communist morality. So we, we need to balance the utopian with the scientific. So um, in the article, I propose a framework that utilizes uh, cultural hegemony. So this is an idea pioneered by the Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci. 
Uh, everyone should read him. If you haven't read his prison notebooks, they're fantastic. Um, in particular, though, in this article, I focus on these concepts uh, that he distinguishes uh, between a war of maneuver and war of position. So in the revolutionary setting, a war of maneuver is generally what we think of when we think of revolution. It's an armed insurrection. It overthrows one class for the other. Um, but Gramsci then starts arguing that this method has been supplemented within capitalism's maturity by um, a multifaceted subterranean kind of cultural struggle, um, which he names a war of position. Um, the left, including uh, and even could be argued, uh, uh, kind of forged the way, uh, the religious left kind of forged the way in this um, and have been involved in this counter hegemonic war position for, for many decades, um, you know, through the creation of dual power organizations or food programs or um, like prison outreach and support, school lunches, um, programs for folks without homes, uh, et cetera. Um, however, Although all of those have these moral bases, they're all still these political wars of position, right? All of these these programs. So what I argue for is that we really need to start uh, fostering a disciplined focus on engaging on a moral war of position. Um, the right wing has understood this far better than we have, unfortunately. And the recent insurrection at the Capitol, I think, is really an outcome of this. Uh, fascists have mobilized... Uh, these really easily digestible moral arguments through meme pages and message boards and discord servers that have spiraled into the kind of moral conspiracies that have materially manifested into incredibly disgusting and violent effects in our world. Um, so I think as leftists, uh, as communists, we not only have a moral obligation to wage revolution, but we we need to work on building a moral counter to the ugly, racist, sexist, homophobic, transphobic, anti-communist grifts that the right is so successful at pulling off. Um, and I think that a lot of Zoomers actually uh, on, on communist TikTok are showing us a really effective avenue in that regard, actually. It's like <laughs> uh, if, you, if you see any of them, they're just like these really poignant one minute, like 21st century agit prop. It's just like really good at like centering on that moral argument um and so that's what i that's what i'm arguing for anyway all right what is to be done get get on tiktok with the zoomers get tiktok yeah, <laughs> yeah right. you know something that kind of like maybe this is like a lingering question and, I, and I, if you don't know exactly how to answer it uh it's fine because it's kind of going uh going off path here but um sometimes well, i guess when i'm when i'm hearing the word morality we're talking about it at a pretty high level like you know um that it's morally wrong for one class well it's morally wrong for the the bourgeoisie to oppress the proletariat right that's like a moral claim that we're making or um or a, a moral claim that like generally like no one should like starve or no one should be houseless or something but I guess I, I wonder, is there a communist morality at like a, even a smaller level? I mean, if the, if the, um, if what's to be done is to start like, you know, waging the, the war of position or something, but that's interesting, I guess. But is there, is there a, a communist morality that's even like changing the relationship between individuals? Like, um, I, I don't know. What do you think about like the smaller, uh, smaller types of morality that we maybe just kind of take for granted at like an interpersonal level? Yeah. Uh, I, I think like, we're seeing a lot of this uh, interpersonal um, war position on an individual basis uh, since the pandemic started, right? Um, like what, what's one of the first things that happened when the pan pandemic uh, hit was mutual aid groups immediately started popping up, right? Like this is uh, purely a communist practice of taking care of your community. You know, this is the, the first stage in any kind of like communist project. So, um, yeah, I, I think that's a, a good point to, we, we can't always focus on the, the high level things. Um, but, you know, taking care of your community, starting community outreach groups, making sure that your neighbors are safe and fed, um, are, are also, uh, part of this communist war position, um, for, for morality's sake, I think. So yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Maybe putting it, maybe, um, maybe putting them at odds is like a, a big, a high level type of morality, and an individual level morality is 
maybe wrongheaded because I guess they are probably connected in some important ways. But I guess what, what sticks out to me in, in thinking about morality and communism in this way is that communism, um, you know, what people usually think of as like an economic theory, I think becomes about the relationships between people in a really compelling way. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's just a, an interesting part of, I think, what you've done. Right, right. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, uh, kind of as you're speaking makes me think too about uh, Mao, who, you know, not my mm -hmm. favorite moral philosopher by any stretch, <laughs> but uh, also an, an important character. Um, you know, Mao uh, has some really, I think, um, compelling arguments about uh, how a communist party should um, orient itself to people who are outside the party, which is essentially to hold yourself to a, a certain moral standard and to present yourself as moral actors, right? That you shouldn't... That's right. uh, yeah. shouldn't be caught doing something that you wouldn't expect a communist to do. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Um, the same thing with like, uh, maybe a better example would be the black Panther party. You know, the, right. uh, the internal rules for how to conduct yourself have a lot to do with, uh, being a moral agent and doing and not doing certain things, not out of uh, road to obedience, but because, you know, you, don't you want to trust the, the revolutionary party to get you somewhere that looks good? Um, something about that. That's compelling. That's right. Yeah. No, I think that's, those are both excellent examples. Um, yeah, that we need, we need to carry ourselves as communists in the world. Um, and, and living a, a communist life is living a moral life. Um, and, um, presenting that, uh, becomes, uh, equally as important as a lot of the high, high level things, you know, um, and I think that came out actually at the Capitol insurrection, you know, um, the left understood that that wasn't a, a, a fight that we should be having, um, you know, a pan leftist fight that we should go out and be having. Um, and the left didn't show up to that. Instead, they took care of their community, made sure that once those reactionaries left the Capitol, that they didn't then go rampaging through the communities in Washington, DC, right? That that's, that's the moral position is that we're taking care of our communities. We're not going to waste our time um, going to, you know, the bourgeois seats of power and fighting for them. We're going to take care of our community and make sure that they're safe and happy, you know? Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think that's the, that those great, great uh, points all around. Yeah. I love that. That's a good example. Well, um, since our audience skews religious, maybe we can sort of close on, on one of those notes. What would you hope that, maybe theologically inclined or religiously shaped uh, readers would take away from your essay? You know, what does thinking of morality in this more dialectical paradigm do that other moral frameworks don't? I, I feel too, I'm, I'm imagining a lot of listeners just like yelling Alistair McIntyre over and over for the last like hour, <laughs> right? This, uh, this Marxist Catholic who becomes a yeah. moral philosopher. Um, yeah, anyway, yeah. that's a, a weird synapse that just fired out of nowhere. But yeah, uh, what, it, what do you hope that those kinds of readers might take away from your essay? Um, yeah, I, I think we covered a lot of what I hope that folks on the religious left would find resonant. Um, particularly the idea that, um, that the dialectics of communist morality allow for a moral resolve, um, as demonstrated by who we've talked about, like Father Haggerty or John Brown or, um, Stephen Simmons Foster, but also that l like we've talked about being open to and, uh, allowing communism to transmute your own morals into um, behaving in a more uh, just or equitable way uh, and being willing to fight for that when necessary. Um, but I also hope that folks will read this piece and see communist morals and morality as an active practice uh, rather than something that merely rests inside of you or or is like a character trait. Um to think of communist morality as a form of praxis, the way that uh, Jesus Christ, for example, saw it. Um, uh, communist morality can be expressed, you know, in like the Jewish practice of tikkun olam, to, to, to repair the world, uh, to build a model society free from oppression of all kinds. Um, so, you know, don't put your communist morality on a shelf. Uh, morals are a craft. Uh, we must forge them uh, in the struggle the same as any other revolutionary tool. I did under a bushel. No, that's what we learned in. There we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Well, that's a really good word. I appreciate you um, pulling all this out for us. I think it's a really interesting piece. And I hope everyone goes on to read it. So, um, folks, if you haven't read it yet, you can go look in the show notes or look on our Twitter. Peacelandbread.com. Uh, you can read it for free. And actually, uh, they just started printing all the uh, editions, too. So if you like to have hard copies, you can get hard copies as well. Fantastic. That's great. It does look very good. Um, anything else that you want to plug here at the end, Taylor, before we uh, sign off? Um, you can find me at uh, taylorgenovese.com uh, or on Twitter at trgenovese. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I had a great time. Thanks for having me. Uh, hopefully we can come back and talk about cosmism. That's right. We got to uh, build our resurrection machine, get ourselves right. out to a different planet where we can all <laughs> build a, a communist church together for sure. We will have that conversation <laughs> down the line, no doubt. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Magnificast. Um, we won't repeat the Patreon pitch. You already heard it in the beginning. Uh, we will say, though, you should definitely follow Taylor. He's always got something wild going on. Uh, Taylor also has a, uh, a bunch of writing that he just sort of puts out there. Um, and it's all really fun. It's about um, the Soviet Union and space, usually. At least that's the stuff that I find myself gravitating toward. And you can definitely support Taylor's research as well. You can follow him and find more details about that. Um, lots of really fun stuff going on with Taylor. Our music, as always, is by the Illogical Spoon at the end and Amoria Armstrong at the beginning. Uh, why I put them in reverse order, who could say? But uh, just switching it up on everybody. <laughs> that's right, switching it up, keeping it interesting, and we'll see everybody next week. I don't want to get up for church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church. We'll meet down by the riverside. There we'll swim with all creation. Never get tired, never bored. Don't worry, someday there'll be no dam between us and our Lord. Jackson, keep your hoods up. Keep your hoods up and you stay up late in Jackson. You keep your hoods up, well you keep your hoods up and you stay up late. Oh, don't mind.